If you're following along with his book, Journey to Hope, we are in the 11th chapter today, and this is the fifth of seven case studies examining what I've decided to call the uh, waypoints along the journey to faith. That's hope sparked, hope sensed, and hope seen. And he's titled this chapter, Throw Away Your Stones. And so if you have the book, you can follow along in the book. And some of you ask me how you could get it. Um, <clears throat> but for all of Brother Layton's skill as an educator and as an author, I'm confident, he, I'm looking at him there in the back, I'm confident that he would wholeheartedly agree that all you really need for life and godliness, you'll find in the scriptures. Okay, good, because that's what the Bible says, and I know he's a follower of, of the scriptures. So it's certainly true for today's story. If you don't have his book and can't follow along, if you'll open up your Bible to John chapter 8, the Gospel of John chapter 8, uh, you will find here the story uh, that we're going to talk about today. Not every one of you will find it in this spot, though. I, maybe everyone here in this building, most of us have the mainstream uh, translations or paraphrases, and that's where it is. But there is some debate, some academic debate primarily, about where this story actually fits in the timeline of Jesus. Some will move it a little earlier into John chapter 7, and, and I personally believe, based on some study, it, it might have occurred a little earlier than where it's placed here in the text, but not much. Some will move it later, uh, after John, t uh, John chapter 21. A few remove it from John altogether and put it in the book of Luke. So the dispute about where it belongs, whether it's John 8 or somewhere else, uh, it isn't really the topic, it is absolutely not the topic of our class today. Uh, and if you're interested in that debate and maybe where it belongs in the timeline, I recommend, just for ease of access, the Wikipedia article that's titled, Jesus and the Woman Taken in Adultery. Now, at the War College, we, don't, we, we tell students, don't use Wikipedia as a reference. But Wikipedia includes, at the bottom of it, all of the scholarly references. But for a quick overview of a subject, we think Wikipedia is a pretty good place to go. It's generally distilled academic stuff that's written for the layperson to understand. So the Wikipedia article titled Jesus and the Woman Taken in Adultery has three sections that I thought were particularly relevant to its location here in John chapter 8. History of textual criticism, textual history, and manuscripts. And a review of those three sections in that Wikipedia article will give you an idea of the differing positions about where this should go in our scriptures. There are probably also people in this room right now who have probably studied this at pretty good length and who may have even taught it at uh, either, either from the pulpit or in a class or perhaps in one of our uh, brotherhood schools. Um, they could also talk in great detail about how we got the Bibles that we hold in our hands or have on our devices today, going back from ancient times to today. And they could probably teach classes on how the ancient texts came to be read and interpreted. But I'm not those people, and this is not that class. So as an article of faith, I'll ask you to take this story's presence in our Bibles, in John chapter 8, as an indicator of its inspiration. And we'll treat it with the respect that we treat the rest of John's gospel and indeed the rest of scripture. <clears throat> John's gospel is the only place where this story appears in scripture. So I'll ask you to read along with me if you have your Bibles open to John chapter 8 or listen closely as I read John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. And I have the New International Version uh, as ever in front of me this morning. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us, or in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. 
But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. As I mentioned before, this event is known to Wikipedia as the woman taken in adultery. But Brother Layton recommends in his book considering a title change for this story. What do you think about the woman forgiven for adultery? It's a small change. It's a small change in the title, not a change in the text. But words, even small changes in words, can cause strong emotions. And adultery is a word like that. It brings to mind unfaithfulness, a betrayal of trust in this closest of human relationships. This unfaithfulness and betrayal established adultery as the reason to dissolve a marriage, or as a reason to dissolve a marriage. It could also carry the death penalty, as we'll see later. But thinking of this event as a story of forgiveness helps us to learn more about the core purpose of the ministry of Jesus. We'll also look at how this event shows Jesus taking a desperate woman through her journey from hopelessness to hopefulness, or hopefulness. Can you see the scribes and the Pharisees, these self-righteous blowhards, just licking their chops at this one? Oh, they had him for sure this time. They had him for certain. They had the physical evidence of a person caught in the very act of adultery. And they had the plain and clear words of the law of Moses on their side. Surely this would bring an end to the charlatan's tricks. There was no way Jesus could talk his way out of this situation. Jesus would have to take up stones with the rest of them and kill the guilty woman right there. Maybe this is what they were thinking as they dragged their victim from a bedroom across town into the temple courts. Now for Jesus, the day had started like many others. Matthew 8 records Jesus telling a would-be disciple that foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So as morning breaks over Jerusalem, Jesus walks the two miles from the Mount of Olives where he had laid his head that night to the temple. John writes that Jesus is teaching a large crowd in the temple when he's interrupted. Can you see the crowd parting as the scribes and Pharisees drag a disheveled and bewildered woman to Jesus? And I chose the word drag on purpose. It seems right to me because about half of the English translations say that they have to make her stand. The other half give the sense that she was kind of dumped in the presence. But half of them say that they stand her up. So I can see him dragging her. And she may be kicking and screaming. She may not. She just may be out of sorts. But then they prop her up and they've got her standing there in front of Jesus and this whole crowd. And they make their accusation then and there that she's been caught in the very act of adultery. And they demand a decision from Jesus on the spot on whether they should stone her to death for her grievous and heinous, or in a vernacular, grievous and hyenous violation of the revered law of Moses, lo indeed, Leviticus chaptereth the twentieth, and verseth the tenth, the adulteresseth shalleth be put it to death. But do you think these people really cared at all about justice or about obedience to the law? Scripture tells us their real motive was to trap Jesus in a no-win situation where either they could accuse him of violating the law of Moses 
or for breaking Roman civil law. Because if Jesus obeyed the law of Moses, he would break Roman law, because Roman law reserved capital punishment for the Romans to administer. If he didn't stone the woman to death on the spot, he was obviously breaking the law of Moses. And it is absolutely true that the man should have been there with her if she was caught in the act of adultery. Her partner should have been right there because Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10 does indeed condemn both the adulterer and the adulteress. But John focuses his gospel account on the woman. And so will we. This woman. Pitiful. Helpless. Dragged out of the bed of adultery and into the front of the Sunday morning auditorium class. It wasn't a Sunday morning, probably. But you get the image. It's as though these folks had dragged her down the center aisle and stood her up while the Lord is teaching. Her hair is a mess. She's underdressed. And she's utterly hopeless. Now, Jesus might have been born at night, but he wasn't born last night. These folks did not fool him with this trap. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us directly that he knows and suspects their true, method, their true motives, but it does say, John records, they were using this question as a trap in verse 6. Jesus' actions certainly indicate that he is not falling for the trap. He silently bends down and begins to write in the dirt with his finger. Not good enough for these folks. They've gone to a lot of trouble to bring this, this test case to Jesus. And they keep pressing him. Some versions say they persisted in questioning him. Others say they kept on asking. Others say kept demanding an answer. So can you see Jesus? The teacher people had crowded around to hear being silent. And the power of that silence. Can you see how much this would have aggravated these Pharisees? We don't know how much time went by with the crowd watching this scene play out. The insistent Pharisees, the great teacher reduced to silence scribbling in the dirt. And then Jesus stands. In the New King James Version, it says he raised himself up. I love the way that's phrased. And I'm going to go to the five most reputable literal translations here to make the order emphatic of what Jesus said. Two of these literal translations say, the sinless of you. One says, the one sinless among you. Another says, the sinless among you. And the fifth, him faultless among you. That's who Jesus is talking to, the sinless one. And it's easier to lose the emphatic subject of Jesus' address in our smoother and more modern English translations. But it's obvious enough, even here in my New International Version, in the silence that settled on the pestering Pharisees and the eager crowd in response to Jesus' dramatic rise from the ground, Jesus made it clear that he was challenging every person there to check themselves first. And if they find themselves to be sinless, they can be the first to throw a stone. Then he crouches down again to ride in the dirt. The great teacher remained silent. An older accuser turns away. Then another. Then more, but one by one. Again, drawing from the best literal translations. One by one. The accusers heard Jesus challenge them, not as a group, but they took his challenge individually. This was a personal encounter with Jesus, the Messiah. And for each accuser, the result was an admission that their conscience wasn't clean. In the hush, beginning with the oldest, the accusers slipped away. 
perhaps dropping the stones that they'd collected from the rubble of constant temple renovations and road paving projects. The most self-righteous of them might have been the last to leave, but in the face of Jesus' test, even that most self-righteous one had to drop his accusation and slink away in defeat. This time. But pride is powerful, and they'll be back again. And again, and again, spoiler alert, until their ultimate defeat at the cross. As this bit of theater plays out, eventually the standing woman and the crouching Lord are left in this bustling temple court. Why doesn't she flee, run off? Perhaps hope is sparked in her. That this man who defanged her accusers has more to say. And indeed he does. Jesus stands again and asks where her accusers have gone. And if anyone remains to condemn her. So looking around she respectfully says that none remain there of her accusers. And so Jesus declares judgment on her case. A merciful judgment free of condemnation... But I'd suggest it's also a probationary judgment. As she goes free, she must sin no more. She must change her sinful life. So like always, as we examine this passage, we can learn so many lessons about, the, about Jesus, about his life, about who he interacted with. And one of the lessons that we can learn is that Jesus came to forgive, not to condemn. Jesus says this directly in other places, but also in John 10, verse 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that people may have life and have it abundantly. And like we've done each week in the case studies, we need to put ourselves in the place of the person who came into contact with Jesus. We are clearly guilty. And there is a clear death sentence to be carried out. And we have no reason to expect anything but punishment. Now, this is not an extreme thought, nor is it an unreasonable thought. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All includes me. For all of us, our sins have separated us from God. But there's so much more to the gospel message that shows the grace and mercy of God made available to us in Jesus. Paul teaches us in the epistles that we are declared free from the guilt of sin. That is, we're justified. And that happens as a result of God's grace. God's grace is given as a gift by Jesus through his sacrificial death. It's an offering that's an acceptable compensation by God. And a fun theological word for that is propitiation. Not the topic of this class, but a great word for looking up later. In granting us grace, God shows his divine nature of love and forgiveness. And we receive the grace through obedient faith. Ephesians 2.8, James 2.18, many, many more examples and passages there. And I want you to note, and I've mentioned this several times so much that in the War College we say it's a foot stomper. Uh, you probably can't hear my foot stomping, but this is a foot stomper. We are not earning salvation through our obedient faith. It's not like God owes us the salvation as wages for the work that we've put in to save ourselves. No way. Instead, we receive salvation because of the one we put on. It's not the work we put in, but the one we put on. It's not the work we put in, but the one we put on. I, I thought that was catchy. Did that, does that not seem? I thought that was pretty catchy. Um, all right, maybe if it doesn't work for you, it does work for me. It helps me remember it. In this event uh, that we're studying today, <clears throat> there's a distinction between it and previous ones, and that's that Jesus takes the first step to the woman. The woman in this event does not profess her faith to Jesus, or if she did, it's not recorded for us. But this 
also shows the amazing grace of Jesus. He did not demand a profession of faith. Maybe she wasn't in a condition where she could have given a profession of faith. She might not have been in a condition to even beg for mercy from him. Did she even know who this guy was? We don't know, doesn't say. But the longer the Pharisees pestered him for judgment, the more she would have been able to pick up if she wasn't still freaked out by her arrest, uh, by a lynch mob of the scribes and Pharisees. But instead of demanding a profession of faith, Jesus asked an easy question. Where are your accusers? This was the life and death question that was occupying her mind from the time they broke into the bedroom and started dragging her into the temple courts. And of course, she could answer that. And Jesus' merciful judgment planted the seed for her redemption if she would change her life. Now, certainly, the woman in this event wanted mercy. She didn't want justice because that would have meant death. But could she have even hoped for grace? We all know the passage, John 3, 16, in the conversation with the scholar Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But John 3, 17 is so applicable to our study today. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God loves me, helpless me, deserving of death me, unable to save myself me, unforgivable me. And because Jesus loves me, he made a plan from the very beginning to forgive me, to send Jesus to show the way and to become the way. Paul teaches us that Jesus did this even when we were rebellious to God, when we were unrepentant, undeserving sinners, not seeking Jesus, not looking for forgiveness in full rebellion, Romans chapter 5, 6 through 8, other passages, but that's particularly good. God knows our need. He knows our inability to figure out how to meet our need. We can't do it ourselves. So Jesus comes to us offering what we need. But do we need the law of Moses? Yes, to teach us how bad sin is. The law for adultery is clear. You get stoned to death. But the law also offers mercy. And so we need the law because it gives the full picture. God is merciful. God acknowledges repentance in the example of the story of David and Bathsheba. David's sins were exposed and David repents. He receives forgiveness not because it was the law, but because God is merciful and acknowledges repentance. David writes in Psalm 51, 16 and 17, almost certainly about that situation in his life. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. All through the days of the law of Moses, God accepted the offering of various sacrifices to free his people from their sins. And we know from this side of the cross that these many repeated sacrifices, especially the blood sacrifices, depended on and were were, um, uh, based on, empowered by, the sacrifice of Jesus' blood on the cross. This ultimate once-for-all sacrifice. At the cross, Jesus puts into effect a greater law, the law of liberty, as James 1.25 calls it. And this law of liberty is a law that frees us from sin. Jesus said as he began his ministry that his purpose wasn't to destroy the law of Moses, but instead to fulfill it. John 5, 17 records that in John's gospel. Six times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses this form. You have heard it said, mm-hmm, one. but I say, mm-hmm, whatever. In each case, Jesus corrects a human misunderstanding of God's will. Jesus didn't just tell it, 
He also showed it by what he did in front of crowds large and small and to individuals such as the woman in this event. Jesus taught love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And he also demonstrated those character traits in this and many other singular events. And it's all we could ever hope for. So as I try to do each week, let's examine this event in light of the waypoints along the journey to hopefulness. Hope sparked, then hope sensed, and hope seen. Well, how is this woman's hope sparked? We see in the event, as the woman is dragged in front of Jesus, clearly guilty of her crime, that she has no hope. Yet, she hears an unexpected statement from the one designated by the scribes and Pharisees to be her judge. Instead of questioning her, she hears Jesus turn their accusations into a challenge to their self-righteousness. Then she sees her accusers turn away, convicted of their own guilt by a simple but cutting and insightful question from the Messiah. And maybe we can infer that the woman starts to sense hope when Jesus rises a second time after the accusers were dispersed by his probing statement. Perhaps she hopes for condemnation but dismissal. Maybe she would hope for referral to a later Jewish court of religious law, something like that, I don't know, civil court, I don't know. Anything would be better than the lynching that she faced in that moment. But instead of hearing any of those things, she hears a question that forms the foundation of emerging hope. Jesus asks where her accusers are. And perhaps the formerly hopeless woman now begins to realize she is alone before the judge and there's no prosecuting attorney present. There are no witnesses for the prosecution to give evidence for her crime. It's just her. And perhaps now, in the closing statement of Jesus, the woman receives a promise of hope seen. A changed life that's made possible by Christ. Left alone by her accusers, the woman stands before the judge. Who upholds the law of Moses. Doesn't violate it. He upholds the law of Moses. By saying that since her accusers are not there to accuse her, neither does he. Now remember, under the law of Moses, there must be more than one witness before a crime can be accused. Numbers 35.30, Deuteronomy 17.6, and 19.15, etc. Therefore, Jesus is able to fulfill the law by discounting the charge and setting the woman free. But Jesus went further than just freeing her from the death sentence of stoning that she had deserved by her crime. Of course, that is a big, very big, huge offering of hope. But that isn't the hope that she grasped most of all. Jesus forgives her. Who is this who forgives sin? He acknowledges her sin, but removes it at that moment. And not that many days later, he removes it in his great and expansive act of sacrifice at the cross. Can we have a few more minutes this hour to spend with the woman who's standing before Jesus? Perhaps time for a sidebar about what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Not included in the NIV. Maybe it's included in your versions? Anyone? Probably not. There might be a footnote with some ideas, some teaching notes, and I've seen many of those. Yeah. Yeah. But lying 
it, it might be, we're not, it's not recorded in Scripture, but it might very well be that Jesus on the ground was writing justice and then mercy and then grace. Maybe that's what he wrote on the ground. That, that principle that there is justice and the law accounts for it. And there's mercy, which the law accounts for. And then there's grace, which Christ came to give. It, it might be that he was scri scribbling random letters on the ground. We don't know. Could have just been writing the alphabet out or just, you know, just drawing random lines in the dirt, just killing time, waiting for them to reach that perfect moment when he could ask his, ask his question. Maybe Jesus was writing scriptures related to mercy or to grace that he could have written from the Torah, the first five books, or from the prophets. <clears throat> Maybe he was listing the accusers. I've heard folks say this. He's writing the name of the accuser and then listing their sins underneath it. I'd heard somebody say, maybe that's what he was writing. I, I don't know. That certainly would have been fearful if it had been me standing there. I certainly don't want my name and my sins to be right here in front of the assembly. Terrifying. We don't know what he wrote. Maybe he wrote something about the woman. Maybe he wrote about her family life. Maybe he wrote about the good she'd done. We don't know. We don't know what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Scripture doesn't decide to share with us what's there. And that's a deliberate decision. Nothing's here on accident. Nothing's left out on accident. But we know from the Bible what Jesus wrote on her heart. And he, what he wrote on her heart was the hope of grace. The hope of getting what she doesn't deserve. This hope that she was given was sparked when, when Jesus didn't immediately answer the accusers and say, well, you guys have got stones. Take care of it. Why do you bring her to me? You know the law. Hope was sensed as he rose to ask who was left among her accusers. And she could see hope. Her hope was seen as he offered her forgiveness. Now, what became of her? We don't know. This grace was offered. Did she take it? We don't know. I'm going to guess. Just speculation. Just my opinion. Just my guess. My guess is that she changed her life. That she learned more about who Jesus is from those people. Now, the accusers had come. Jesus was teaching a crowd. The accusers came in kind of interrupted the class. She's standing there. Maybe after he offers her this hope, this grace, maybe she sits down to listen. Oh, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe, though, she did learn from someone or from Jesus himself who Jesus is and what he is, the Messiah. I would guess that she would do that. And I would guess that after learning who this man was, she would have joined those in Jerusalem who believed in him. And maybe she was one of the people lining the road as he carried the cross and then had it carried for him up to Calvary. Maybe she heard the message at Pentecost that we could read about in Acts chapter 2. Maybe sometimes in quiet moments, reflecting on the life that she used to lead and the salvation she received first from the stones and then eternal salvation from her sins, she would have felt awe and wonder for the one who really knew what she needed. Compassion. Mercy. Forgiveness. Last week in the story of Zacchaeus, I think someone suggested, when I was like, hey, y'all know the song? And someone suggested standing on the promises, I think was the suggestion. And we, then we sang Zacchaeus was a wee little man. <clears throat> but the song standing on the promises uh, was suggested. And, and this woman didn't know it at first, but when she was dragged in front of the crowd and they stood her up there in the temple court in front of Jesus, she was standing on the promises. She didn't know it. Jesus had to show it to her. Well, if this that I imagine happened to the woman, that she responded obediently, interestedly, if that can be a word, committedly to learn who Jesus was and to follow him through the, rema the remainder of his life and then to be a member of the church that was founded there at Pentecost. 
Well, if that is indeed what happened to the woman, if she chose to respond to this encounter with Jesus, if she lived a life of faith, Brother Leighton notes in his book that she would love our song, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. This woman who was dragged from the very bed of iniquity into the temple courts, figuratively speaking, through that door right back there, right down this aisle, right in front of all of us, while Jesus was teaching, forced to stand in front of the accusing lynch mob while they basically were begging Jesus to deliver the death sentence that she knew she deserved. Well, she knows what it meant to stand in the presence of Jesus, surrounded by her accusers. And the last part of the event, she knows what it means to stand in the presence of Jesus alone. Because he's driven the accusers away. And this is us, brethren, friends. This is us. We have stood in the presence of Jesus Unable to hide our guilt as our accuser urges that we get the death sentence that we deserve. And we've also stood, if we're believers, if we're members of the household of faith, we have stood in the presence of Jesus alone. Because because when we name his name as our Savior, when we obey his gospel... He has driven the accuser away in ignominious, abject, humiliating, and absolute defeat. And I think she, like we, would sing, I stand amazed, overwhelmed by our deliverer and the hope that he brings. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. This is not wonder. This wonder that, that's felt here that we sing about, this is not wonder like I wonder if he's going to end on time or give us a couple extra minutes. It's not that kind of wonder. This wonder is amazement. I stand amazed in the presence. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. This is us. This is me. This is you. I will stand in the presence of Jesus, accused by Satan, Revelation 12, 10. But if I put on Christ and have lived faithful, not perfect, but faithful, then faith will become sight when I witness the accuser fleeing and Jesus declaring that those who are found in him, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that the accuser is cast down and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus Because the spirit of life sets us free from sin and death. I hope you'll take this inspirational message of hope with you through the rest of this day.